I'm here with Representative John Payne, a Republican who represented the 106th District in Dolphin County between 2003 and 2016. Thank you very much for being with me today. Thanks for the invite. I look forward to it. All right. I'd like to ask you some questions about your time in the House, but before we get to that, could you describe your childhood and family life and how that prepared you for public service? Sure. Uh, I grew up in Hershey when it was a small town of less than 3,000 people, and we had one red light in the whole town. Uh, my mom and dad owned a little grocery store, and when the big box stores came to town, they sold the grocery store. My dad went to work for WKBA, WKBO Radio in Harrisburg, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, I'd like to thank my father's salesmanship I inherited, uh, and I'd like to thank my mother's charitable uh, qualities as far as church and the food banks and stuff like that I've also picked up. Nice. Um, could you describe your educational background? Sure. Graduated from Hershey High School. I went to Hack for two years. I was going to go to Shippensburg College uh, for my last two years. My best friend, Todd Pagarola, had done the exact same thing. Uh, but ironically, when I graduated from high school, five of us drove down to Lebanon and signed up for the Pennsylvania National Guard. Mm -hmm. Fast forward two years later, we were all called to active duty during that time frame, so I never got to complete the last two years at Shippensburg. Um, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about your career before you were a representative here in the House? Yeah, I, I worked a lot of jobs as a kid. I think most kids do. And then my first adult type job was working at Hershey Chocolate. And I did that every day from pretty much six to three. And then I would come home, watch the kids get off the bus, have dinner early, and leave by 5.30, quarter to six to go over to the park, the arena, the stadium. And I worked there a second job basically from 6 to 11 uh, almost every day, including weekends. And I did that for 18 years uh, so that my first wife could stay at home and raise the three kids. Wow, those are long days. Yeah. <laughs> um, what became, made you become interested in politics, and what were some of your first political experiences? Well, actually, my best friend, again, Todd, uh, had been fire chief. And when he left as fire chief, I became fire chief. And if you've ever been in a fire department, there is no worse politics than fire company politics. Uh, there are cliques and groups and all kinds of stuff going on. When you're not out doing the emergency work, that sitting in that firehouse creates a lot of questions, a lot of pressure, and sometimes dissension. So I was kind of honed on politics and firehouse politics. And Todd ran for local supervisor in Derry Township. So, of course, when my time was up as a fire chief, he convinced me to run for local supervisor in Derry Township. And I spent 10 years as a supervisor in Derry Township. I loved it. It is the best form of government mm. because you can actually do something. You can actually have people, the trash wasn't picked up, the snow wasn't removed, uh, you're in charge of the park and rec, the library, the fire, the police. I mean, everything is down at that level. And if somebody called you, you actually had the ability to pick up the phone and call the township manager and get it fixed. Uh, I then ran for Dolphin County Commissioner, and I spent three years there. I had planned on making that a career when Representative Tooley, who had the job before me, out of the clear blue announced he was not running for re-election. Uh, shocked me, shocked everybody in Hershey, because we all thought Chick would be here forever and retire from this job a long, long time from now. And when he made that announcement, I did not announce right away. That was on a Tuesday when it broke, and I waited till Saturday when he and I had breakfast. And I said, are you serious? Are you kidding? What's going on? And when he said, no, and you should run for that job, there were already six candidates ahead of me. But I did. I threw my hat in the ring, per se, and, and ran for office and uh, had an interesting couple of first election cycles. Can you describe some of your early campaigns? Well, uh, the first one was uh, getting elected by the committee people to take Chick's spot to get your name in the ballot. And then the primary, we had uh, basically a lady from Hummelstown ran against me. And I'll never forget the first candidate's night in the library at Hershey. They made you leave so you didn't hear what the other candidates said. Uh, and then she had to leave when I spoke. So you couldn't switch notes, compare notes, that kind of stuff. Well, I went first and left, and I'm out in the lobby waiting, and she got done talking, and my wife came out afterwards and all upset, and I'm like, what's wrong? Well, you can't believe she said this and this and this and this. Doesn't sound like the man I married. That was my first exposure to dirty politics and how ugly it could get. 
It got very ugly in the primary and the general. I spent close to $140,000 on $100,000 in the primary and $40,000 in the general uh, to win uh, the House seat. Wow. That's, that's pretty competitive for the early ones. Um, has campaigning changed since you've been in office, and do you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't enjoy the campaign part. I think the two-year term is the, ridiculous. You're not really, it's not a two-year term, it's a one-year term. You, you'll get sworn in in January of 17, and right after the November election in 17, you start thinking about January, I got to circulate petitions, uh, you know, by April I'll have a primary, then I got the general election next year, and then it starts all over again. And you're constantly asking people for money, which many times are your friends, which is frustrating. And being that you run every year, you're always there at their door asking for money. And the other thing that's frustrating is you need 300 names on a petition. They mustn't teach that in school anymore because most people don't know why you're there with a petition to get your name on when you're this sitting rep. Why do you need this petition? Well, if I don't get the 300 names, I don't get in the ballot for the primary, da 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 da, and you know, that's, so there's really three elections in a given year. You have to get 300 good names. I always shot for 800 to 1,000, so nobody could challenge them. If you win that and get your name in the ballot, then you have the primary race. If you win that, then you have the general election race. And I've always had uh, general election races up until the last term. Mm -hmm. um, does your family assist with campaigns, or, and how has your public service affected them? Well, actually, fortunately, at this stage of my career, my children are all grown, and we have grandchildren. We have four kids and six grandkids. But as a supervisor, it definitely affected them over those 10 years. Uh, you were going to meetings. You were doing things. You missed, like all elected officials do, you missed sporting events. You missed the, the choir recital. You missed mm -hmm. the music event. Uh, you missed the lots of times things that they're doing that you want to go and see and do, you just can't do. Uh, that certainly factor into my decision to not seek another term was, you did that to your children, do you want to do that to your grandchildren? And the answer was no. I want to spend more time with my grandkids. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any memorable swearing-in ceremonies? Well, the first one. You never forget the first one. Uh, you know, you had uh, just the awe of being in that chamber and looking up at the ceiling and all the flowers on the desk and uh, I, I don't think it really sunk in that you know I'm here pinch me is this for real until after the swearing in and you're everybody's congratulating everybody and you realize how fortunate you are to be one of the few people who represents uh, the 106th district. Nice. Um, can you describe your district and what makes it unique? Well, I think everybody has a unique district. It's, uh, you know, I'm blessed. I have a little bit of urban, a little bit of rural. Uh, um, we're close to Harrisburg. The district starts at the Harrisburg city line. So we have Swadara Township. We have the Eisenhower Interchange, which is a huge interchange connecting 83 and 81. The airport, HIA, is in the district. So I have the airport. I have Hershey Park in the district. I have the Giant Center in the district. I have Penn State Med Center in the district. I have Penn State Harrisburg campus in the district. So I've got all that activity stuff, and then I have plenty of farming in Conawaga Township, still farming in Lower Swatara Township. So, and then, of course, you have the Milton Hershey campus, which is 10,000 acres of clean and green and farms. And it's so you got the best of both worlds, I think. Nice. Um, what issues are important to the people in that diverse district? It, you know, it depends on the, the year and the time. One thing's been consistent for my 14 years here. I've consistently heard, don't raise my taxes. That shouldn't surprise anybody. But I've also heard, go up there and get something done. Work with people. They're tired of the partisan bickering back and forth, and they really don't care to hear that. They're frustrated with Washington. Uh, and they get frustrated with us sometimes. The other year when we didn't have a budget, uh, the parties all spin it that, well, it's the Democrats' fault, it's the Republicans' fault. When you go talk to the average person back home in the, in the diner, they don't want to hear that. They want you to go to Harrisburg, work with people, get something done, and oh, by the way, don't raise my taxes. Um, you've been able to secure some important legislative funding for your district. Um, is there any that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, I, we've been very successful in the highway and road bridge funding. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but we were actually the number one house district in the whole Commonwealth for funding. We got uh, $1.2 billion in funding. 
Uh, some of that, I'm sure, is because of the road network for Hershey Park, some's for the Penn State, some's for the airport, and some's because of Eisenhower Interchange. But we were very successful in being the largest funded uh, house district in the whole Commonwealth. Uh, second thing is I've been very proud to secure $1.2 million every year for funding at HCAR. The Hershey Center for Applied Research is right across the street from the Lifeline hangar. It's an indiscreet building that people drive by every day and have no idea what's going on in there. Uh, but we have several companies that are doing great things. Um, one company developed a machine to detect early eye degeneration. And that started as an incubator company and they built a homemade box to see if it would work and they tested and tested. They now have a machine that's commercially available and Kerm and I in Hummelstown got one of the first machines. Um, there's another company, Targaputics, that's working on a brain cancer treatment. Probably the most exciting um, companies down there are the two, Apogee and, and Targaputics, who are doing the brain cancer treatments. We've got FDA approved clinical trials on people who have terminal brain cancer. There is no cure, no hope. Uh, the first trial of people, there are eight people still alive to this day thanks to the treatment of that drug. They've now expanded the third phase, which is now worldwide. They're doing testing in Tel Aviv, Australia, uh, Europe. So there's 414 patients. We'll know the end of uh, 17, the results of that trial. Wow, that's very exciting. Yeah, right here, <clears throat> right here in Hershey, and uh, I, I would venture a guess 99% of the people have no idea that that's actually occurring or just how successful some of these trials have been. That is exciting. Um, moving on to your house time, did you have any mentors when you began working here? Uh, actually, I had several. I mean, Chick and I had been friends since boyhood. I mean, we grew up together. His dad ran a grocery store. My, I mean, a shoe store. My dad ran the grocery store. My mom and dad knew Chick's mom and dad. And then, of course, the key was that Chick's dad actually supplied shoes to the needy children. So my mom at Christmas would go see him to get shoes for the kids, and we'd take food and shoes to the children's homes. Uh, so Chick was a good mentor. Uh, clearly, I was blessed to have Mark McNaughton that was still here, and he helped me actively on the floor. So Chick could be off the scenes because he was no longer here, and Mark would help me on the floor of the house. Both were very helpful that freshman year because you would sit there, as all freshmen must sit there, and say, what are we doing? <laughs> what, what, what's this bill do? Um, have you taken on a mentor role for anyone? I, I have. Uh, I think more so as chairman of the gaming committee. I've had six freshmen on the committee this year from the Republican side and uh, some Democrats. And I get along very well with my co-chair, Nick Kodak. He and I are both classmates. We came in together. Mm -hmm. um, our wives are friends. We've had dinner together. So you do build relationships outside the House chamber. And that's important. I think it helps you as you do legislation on the floor that it's not always the Republicans against the Democrats. You actually build friendships together. And uh, a lot of the freshmen, uh, when we were on committee trips, would ask me questions not just about gaming but other legislative stuff. And it makes you proud to be able to help somebody else and say maybe if one little thing that you tell them can help them in their political career, good for them. Nice. Um, What's your relationship with the media been? Uh, the media was tough in the beginning. Um, I think part of that was just driven by the fact that I'd come from the county and came here and I hadn't finished my term there and a chick had resigned from here to not run anymore, or not resign, but decided not to run anymore. Um, and there was some like, well, you guys are friends and, you know, only one person ran against me and you know was this fair and equitable the reality is there were seven people that ran in the committee structure in the Dolphin County Republican Committee and you straw polled to be the person that was going to be on the ballot and it took three rounds of straw polls before the one person had a clear majority and that just happened to be me and I think also too the media has gotten harder over the years I mean they look for the negatives I used to get frustrated and say, you know, there's good stories going on here. Uh, I would do Eagle Scout awards, and I've done hundreds of Eagle Scout awards in the 14 years I, I've been here. And one of my early speeches would be, I'd, I'd welcome everybody to the to the Eagle Scout award, and then I'd say, oh wait, wait, they're they're in the back, and everybody would turn. 
there comes channel so-and-so and channel so-and-so and channel. They're all coming to film the Eagle Scout Award. Oh, that's right, they're not here because this boy didn't murder somebody, wasn't arrested for selling drugs. He did something positive. There's something wrong that we don't have a positive two minutes on news at night to tell the good stories that the boys and the girls, the young men and women, are doing in our communities. And that used to frustrate me. Um, you've talked a little bit about um, partisanship impacting the work you do. Is it becoming harder? It is. I think each election cycle, uh, when I first came to the House, uh, it was norm to go in committee hearings, and you, that's how you build those relationships when you're not in the floor of the House, but you're in Pittsburgh or Philly or somewhere doing a hearing on a topic. Uh, and I was blessed that the Tourism Committee traveled, the Liquor Committee traveled, the uh, Consumer Affairs Committee traveled. So you got to know the other person as a person, not as a Democrat. Uh, and with less travel and less committee hearings, it's gotten worse. And I also think the redistricting has made each district so lopsided. It's either solid Republican or solid Democratic. So there's less and less of a need for the relationships and the working together to get things done. I've always been proud of my district. I've been endorsed by both the far right and the far left. And, you know, a lot of people are like, how, how can you have a union endorse you? But you know, the conservative section endorses you. You can, you should. You should be able to be a moderate. A moderate is not a four-letter word. Okay. Um, you were part of several informal caucuses. Um, what role did they play in the legislative process and which were maybe some of your favorites? Yeah, the, I'm on four. Lupus Caucus, uh, Harry and Tim came to me and asked me if I'd co-chair that with them. Again, two Democrats wanted to have somebody they knew and trusted. Uh, but the other three I actually founded. Uh, I founded the Motorsport Caucus, which was designed to help racing in Pennsylvania. Now, people thought it was all about the Poconos. It wasn't, although the Pocono two races generate six figures in income for the state and is a huge economic boom to the Pocono area, not just the racetrack itself. Now they have a third race. They have the Indy race, so they have the two NASCAR and a one Indy race. So it's big business. It's not just racing. I also formed the uh, uh, Masonic Caucus, and that, when I first got here, I knew there were some Masons, but it was kind of like quiet, and I remember going and talking to somebody, and they're like, is there any reason we can't do this? And they're like, no, there's none at all. And the older guy I talked to said, it's a great idea, you ought to do that. <laughs> and I thought, well, that, you bring it up, guess what happens? There are now 40 members in the House and 10 members in the Senate that are Masonic members. Mm -hmm. And we strive to help uh, make sure legislation is passed that benefit our children, protect our children, and do things that make children's lives just better overall. And I also formed the Second Amendment Caucus. And while there were members that believed in the Second Amendment, we never had a true caucus to present to our leadership team and there are 88 members of the Second Amendment Caucus, both Republicans and Democrats. Again, a mechanism to talk to each other and to unite together on legislation that we both support. My co-chair there is Dom Costa, and Dom was a police chief who was shot. So if there's anybody who wants to talk to you about Second Amendment and the right to own a gun, Dom is one of those guys. So between you know, all those people, it's been a great relationship and a great way to, to build together. Nice. Um, what legislation throughout your time have you been most proud to have been a part of? You know, there's no one single piece. A lot of people think it's, you know, well, it's the natural gas reg or it was the uh, allowing uh, health savings accounts for Pennsylvania when the feds passed it, each state had to pass it. Uh, the, my thing I'm most proud about is the customer service back home. Uh, when I first got elected, uh, all the staff would refer to the people as either a constituent or a voter. And the first rule was stop calling them voters. I don't want to hear that because they only vote two days a year. So there's 365 days in a year. For 363 of those, there are constituent. And constituent just seems so manila, so plain, so distant, if you will. And you got to remember, I worked for the Hershey Company for almost 30 years, and I worked for uh, Hershey Estates, H-E-N-R, for almost 18 years. Both customer service organizations where the customer was important to you. And that's the approach I brought to the district office. They're not voters or constituents. They're our customers. 
And we would mail out a customer service form every month. We still do to this day to a section of the people who contact us. We'll mail that form out and say, you contacted our office. If you call our office, did we answer the phone courteously? Did we get the correct information? Did we mail it back to you in a timely manner? Was it what you asked for? Give your overall experience dealing with our office. Was it positive or negative on a scale one to five? I mean, that helps reinforce how not just I am doing, but how the staff is doing. I'm most proud of that, that we've actually have improved customer service to the point that they're not a voter and they're not a Republican or a Democrat. They're our customer. Legislatively, I'd have to laugh at the two license plate bills. Not that I'm proud of that, but the frustration of trying to get a simple bill passed for a veteran. We had a crazy rule at PennDOT that if your car or truck weighed more than 8,000 pounds, you could not have a vanity plate that said veteran. Now, the last time I looked, whether you're driving a VW or a tractor trailer, if you're a veteran, you're still a veteran. But we had that law in place. So we got legislation passed that changed it that now it matches the federal level that unless you need a, uh, a commercial driver's license, a CDL, you can have a veteran plate in anybody's car. That took nine years. Uh, it also took us seven years to get a plate that says, in God we trust on. Uh, 37 states have in God we trust plates, but for Pennsylvania we didn't. The last time I looked, it's still printing our money, it's kind of important. So we got that passed. I think it was the, almost became fun for the challenge, like, okay, you don't want to get this passed? I'm coming back again. <laughs> we, we're going to get this. It, this system is designed to wear you down, and if your idea is not real, real good, you'll give up. If it is a good idea, you'll keep coming back, you'll keep introducing it, and eventually it'll become law. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the um, health savings accounts. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, when the feds passed that legislation, it allowed you to take money off of your paycheck, uh, pre-tax, and put it in this account that you would have money for your co-payments, for other things that weren't covered by insurance and stuff like that, particularly if you have children and I had four growing up, I mean, things happen. They're, they're in and out of different hospitals and doctor's visits and specialists and all the other things. Uh, and then you could use that money tax-free uh, to help pay for those kind of things. I thought it was a great federal initiative and I thought it was great that Pennsylvania passed that too. Nice. Can you describe your work as part of the Liquor Control Committee and the efforts to change and update some of Pennsylvania's well, it's funny, in 15 when the speaker called me and I was up for chairmanship, uh, there were two chairs left. It was urban affairs or, or uh, gaming. And I said, hmm, urban affairs, maybe I could do one hearing in Philly and one hearing in Pittsburgh. It'd be an easy year. And the speaker said, that's a nice try, but you'll be the chairman of gaming. And then I said, well, okay, Mr. Speaker, you never say no to the speaker. And I said, well, I know you only get to pick one committee and as Prior to that, I was on five, but once you're a chairman, you have to give them all up except one. And he asked if I would stay on liquor because there was another privatization vote coming up, and he knew I had continually voted yes in privatization. And again, I never say no to my leader, and I said, sure, I'll be the chairman of gaming and I'll stay on liquor. I think we've accomplished something here in Pennsylvania that's not been done since Prohibition. We've gotten legal expansion of liquor sales in grocery stores and in the uh, mini marts and I believe before we leave this session there might be another opportunity to expand liquor even more. It's time for Pennsylvania to move into the current century and it's frustrating when you realize 48 states allow liquor sales at various places that you know the grocery store and the beer distributors and the 7-elevens and all that stuff only us in Utah restrict liquor sales. Since you mentioned um, your work as the Gaming Oversight Committee Chair, can you talk about what you did and um, have your views on gaming changed since you started in office? Yeah, I, I think it was funny when Mike and I first, the speaker, Mike and I first talked about that. I, I don't smoke, I don't gamble, and other than a glass of red wine once in a blue moon, I don't drink a lot. Uh, so for me to be the gaming chairman, my youngest daughter called me and said, what are you doing, you know? But I think it was a chance for not just me, but the committee, especially with all the freshmen. And some of the senior members had not been active. We had not done a lot since 2010. So when I came in, I thought, look, I know we need money for our budget. I also know that the casinos are under a lot of pressure from surrounding states. 
When we first started in 04 with casinos and then expanded to table games in 10, we had no competition except Atlantic City and we were winning. Atlantic City was closing casinos and we were doing great. Since that time, Ohio has opened casinos and has definitely impacted our casinos in Pittsburgh and Erie. New York has opened casinos. New Jersey is looking at opening two casinos in northern New Jersey, which would drastically impact our trade out of New York City, the people that bust down. Maryland has opened casinos, and there's a casino plan potentially for down in Inner Harbor, which could be the largest casino on the East Coast, a resort and casino. So as all the surrounding states are doing new, new innovative things and expanding, I saw us as just sitting here stagnant. And that's exactly why Atlantic City closed seven casinos, because they sat there when we opened and laughed and said, we're not going to impact them. And we did impact them. And for us to ignore all these other states doing this, we'll be in the same predicament. So I took that approach and said, what can we do to raise money for the state? What can we do to help our casinos grow? Because obviously, if the casinos grow, we get 54% of the take in the slot machines and 14% in table games. It's a one point two, one point four billion dollar business coming to us, to us, so we don't have to raise taxes. So as a private corporation, you'd be the majority shareholder in this. You want your company to do well because the better they do, the more money you make. So that was the approach I took. And uh, as we dug into all the hearings, we did 55 hearings and meetings, more than any committee uh, has ever done. And what we found was we had a huge problem with our children, our underage, under 21, who are online gaming right now, uh, video uh, poker online and poker uh, um, groups that are online and other games that are online are being done all the time by the millennials with their phones and iPads and everything else. And the other problem we have is we have a self-exclusion list at our casinos where if you have a problem and you sign up and say, please don't let me in, either through your own initiative or through family pressure to stop you from gaming, all the casinos will honor that and they'll not let you on the casino floor. But you can sit in your living room and lose $5,000 online and nobody knows anything about it. So there's a great need to regulate online gaming in Pennsylvania both for our minors and for the compulsive gamer. Now, it also won't hurt that we should be able to make some revenue on that regulation, which would help the state's budget crisis. Okay. Um, was there any le legislation that you would have liked to have enacted and, uh, you know, something that sort of got away from you? Yeah, thousands of pieces you'd like to do and you just, you just can't do it. it. You know, it ends up, again, as I said before, that this whole system's designed to frustrate you maybe make you quit, go away. But you know, if it's worth it, if it's worth the fight and you really care, you keep fighting for it. All right. Um, what was your strength as a legislator? I'd like to think, again, my mom and dad. Uh, you know, I had the salesmanship. If, you know, I always joke and tell people, if you can sell yourself and that's all you're selling is yourself. I'm not selling a product that you get any benefit from. And I can get elected over 27 years. I've never lost an election. Uh, so I think the, the salesmanship, and I'd like to think uh, my mom's effort of being a charitable person and uh, being involved in the community. I mean, I spent 25 years in the fire department in Hershey and 10 years in the EMS service in Hershey. I was fire chief for 11 years, uh, active in the church, active in the food banks. Uh, I'm working right now on a project that as soon as I retire, I want to work with uh, the mayor in Hummelstown and the pastor John at our church to try to do something for some needy people there. Uh, my wife and I uh, sponsor almost all the time a child at one of the, at our church who wants to go to camp but doesn't have the money to go to camp. Uh, my parents sent me to church camp. I sent all my kids to church camp. I found it a great experience. Uh, I'd like to be able to do that for those that don't have the fiscal wherewithal to do. Nice. Um, what has been some of the memorable events during your time in the house? Oh, man. Uh, clearly, when we could stay here 24 hours, and when I first got elected, I, I never, ever passed a major piece of uh, legislation or a budget that we weren't here all day, all night, and into the morning watching the sun come up. That's just the way it was. And obviously, the first budget was interesting and challenging. And uh, I remember the gaming bill. 
uh, started at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We were doing an education bill, and uh, the Democratic caucus came in through the doors to the right of the, of the desk, to the left of the speaker from the governor's office, and George Kenney and Ron Raymond said, well, we got a deal on gaming, we're going to run gaming, and I didn't know what they were talking about. And sure enough, the education bill came off the board that quick, and the gaming bill went up on the board 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We went all afternoon, had dinner that night in the caucus room. Midnight, they brought pizza in to help keep us awake. I was counting the roselets in the ceiling by 4 in the morning, I can tell you. Uh, breakfast the following morning, and at 8.40 that following morning, we had final vote on the gaming bill. Uh, obviously, I'll never forget that one. I also won't forget uh, the first year when the budget went past July 1st, and it was, uh, my phone rang, and it was my wife, and she said, uh, you know, the paycheck didn't go into the direct deposit. Uh, the bank had to transfer money out of our savings over the checking. Why didn't you get paid? Mm, I don't know. Uh, well, you better find out. So, of course, I go down, and Brazil was the speaker, and Sam Smith was the majority leader, and I went to Sam, and I said, look, I hate to bother with this, but I got a question. You know, da 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 da. My wife just called, the paycheck didn't go in, and Sam started laughing and laughing, and I'm like, I'm not seeing the humor in this. My wife wasn't too happy about me not getting paid. He said, Did you not pay attention in orientation? I'm like, eh, Probably not. I'm a guy. I guess I didn't. Why? He goes, Every year at budget, you do not get paid direct deposit until the budget is passed, and then you'll get a paper check. Uh, you mean if this budget goes like for a month or two late, I won't get paid till, that's right. So I reached into my pocket, never forget this, I got my flip phone out and I said, here, do you want to call my wife? Because I don't want to tell her. To this day, Sam jokes about that story, but it was true. I had to call her and say, hey, I don't get paid till we pass a budget. Oh. Um, what part of being a representative did you enjoy the least? Running for re-election, having to ask people for money. Uh, having to ask people to sign the petition again and explain why they have to sign it again, even though I'm their representative, I still need those 300 names. Uh, the money was probably the worst part. Uh, I mean, even an election that's, quote, not a tough one, like the first one where I spent all that money, you're still going to spend fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000. I mean, advertising in the paper's expensive, uh, radio time's expensive, uh, mailers, yard signs, door hangers, uh, having to get volunteers to go out and help you do door hangers, because there's no way you can go to all the seven communities. I might have Derry and Hummelstown and Swadire and Lower Swadire and Middletown, Royal and Conewaga, you know, 66,000 people in 30-some thousand households. Uh, that's a lot of doors. and. Uh, I, I like doing doors. I love knocking on doors. I, I enjoyed cold calls, and I'll explain that in a minute. But I did not like having to ask people for money to run, and you were always running for re-election. Uh, the fun part was the cold calls, um, and it all started with uh, my first freshman year. I'd only been here a couple months, and a gentleman called, very upset about something. And uh, my secretary at the time said, here's the phone slip. And I said, well, I'm going to Hershey. I'll just swing by. And I said, I'm calling him. I will drive to the business, and I did. I drove over to Swadire Township and parked the car and went into business. And I'll never forget this. He had a little teller window for his secretary, and I stopped and said, "I'm John Payne. I'm returning so and so's phone call." And she said, "Who?" I said, "John Payne." And he was a construction guy, so he had charge of a big company of construction trucks. And she got in the radio and said, "Hey, uh, John Payne's here to see you." And you could hear over the speaker him say, "Who? John Payne." I didn't call no John Payne. So she comes over to the window and says, I'm sorry, sir, he didn't call you. And I gave her my business card. And she looked, and you could see her face light up. And she went over to the radio and covered the mic and said, it's State Representative John Payne. Home, oh, I called him. You mean he's in my office? Of course, he drove in, and we had coffee, and we were best friends since that. <laughs> and I have done that every month I've been in office. I go out one day, and I do cold calls. Sometimes it's go to a neighborhood and do 50 or 100 homes in a development, just cold call, no reason, not run for re-election. And other times it's stop in a, you know, a dozen businesses and just introduce yourself. I've found that to be so rewarding, so much fun to see people tell you, oh, I've never had anybody come into my business, or I can't believe you're knocking on my door and you're not running for election. But that's what customer service is about. Um. 
who are some of the people that you were able to meet that you might not have otherwise had the opportunity to? Well, everybody in the House and Senate, for sure. I mean, uh, every one of those was impressive, hardworking people. You share the same common bonds, the same concerns, and the same, for the most part, a lot of people dislikes the same thing. As far as, uh, you know, somebody like world famous, uh, the president has been to Hershey uh, twice, so I've gotten to meet two presidents. And uh, probably I met more famous people when I worked at the arena uh, under Hershey Estates. I mean, all the rock concerts came in, all the big names came in, and you would sneak down back in order to get an autograph and do stuff. Uh, that was probably, I met more famous people that way than uh, being a state rep. But I'd like to think, and I mean this sincerely, Every one of the customers I represent is famous to me because they're all important to me. Nice. Um, what would your advice be for a new member coming into the house? A new member to come in is be prepared to spend more time than you think you're going to spend on this job. Um, I know there's uh, constantly, once a year, the media will spin it and say they're the highest paid part-time legislator and they don't do anything and they only work 60 days a year and they play golf all the time. I don't play golf. Uh, but I think it's a full-time job if you do the job right. I mean, it's like everything else in life. Can you do this part-time? Yes. Uh, but it's a challenge to do this and another job. And I think most members who have another job would tell you that. Uh, June in session, you, it's, you're not making contact with that other job. Uh, this fall, very hard to make contact with that other job. So it's a lot more than just those 60 days, particularly when you're in the district. Uh, and maybe that's something I didn't bring up that I always tell the students when they come up. This is like test day on the House floor. It's too late to open the book and say, what does this bill do? You better know what the legislation does before you get here. You better know the issues that your district has before you get here. And you better know where your constituents, your customers are before you get here on these key issues. Once you get here, it's pretty simple. It's a yes or it's a no. Not a lot of debate in it. There's just two buttons you're pushing. The hard job is before you get to that, two buttons. Um, how do you want your tenure to be remembered? Well, I'd, I'd like to think of it as it was fun. And uh, I, you know, people remember me for something other than I always had chocolate on the house floor. I am the candy man. The desk is always filled with candy on the house floor. And I have a big jar in my office uh, up in fourth floor Irvis that's filled with chocolate. And occasionally we go back to the ante room where the coffee machines are and we'll dump co uh, chocolate on the table for everybody. So uh, I'd like they, th they would remind, uh, remember me as the candy man and the man that was, uh, I hope, always smiling. Nice. All right, that's all the questions I have, but I'd like to give you the last word with any final thoughts or something you'd like to say that we didn't cover. Well, I, you know, in closing, I think for me, it's been a great experience. I've loved it. I mean, I don't have any regrets that I ran for the House seat in the years that I've been here. And it's bittersweet in some ways that you, you're leaving. Well, do you want to leave? Yes. Uh, I don't want to do to my grandchildren what I did to my kids, where I was never there, number one. Number two, uh, I'm, I'm not 26 anymore. I'm 66. Uh, I want to move to the next phase of my life while I have the health to do that and the mental capacity to do that. And I'm excited about it. I mean, I'm excited about what challenges God has in store for me in the next job. And uh, while I will miss the people, uh, both back home and here in the chamber, uh, I won't miss the politics of it at all. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy your, your next adventures. Thank you. Thank you.